She smiles just like a river floating softly to the sea. And she floats, floats, floats with my problems. Helps to take, take a little weight off me. She's happy, oh, you know I'm in heaven. She's sad when she ain't gonna say Tuesday, January 18th. Thanks for connecting with this episode of Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you. This episode is proudly presented by our friends at Bitcoin Well. Congratulations to them just opening up their Calgary office. If you're down in Calgary and you have questions about Bitcoin, you want to buy, sell Bitcoin safely, you want to learn more, maybe you need somebody to help you set up a Bitcoin wallet, they can do it. When you deal with them in person, it's white glove service. The one-on-one consultations are free. You can tell, take control of your wealth with help from Bitcoin Well. You can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Coming up in about eight minutes' time, we're going to check in with Dr. Imogen Co. and Professor Timothy Caulfield. Want to find out why they're two of the, uh, well, almost 200 people that signed on to an open letter uh, calling on Spotify to essentially wrap Joe Rogan's knuckles. I mean, that's not the official wording, of course, but they're calling on Spotify to establish a clear and public policy to moderate misinformation on its podcast platform. That coming up in just a little bit, plus what have been some of the consequences of uh, some of the people that have signed on, some of the signatories to that open letter. We'll find out a uh, good conversation coming up there. And then a little bit later on in the show, we're going to talk to Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, uh, the director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab out of the University uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax. We're going to take a look at food prices, grocery prices, and what those could look like by the end of 2022, what you should brace yourself for. should be a great conversation. I'll look forward to your comments there on how your family is dealing with rising costs. Uh, household incomes aren't always matching the inflation that Canadians are experiencing, and a big arena where you see evidence of that is in food prices. So we'll be getting to that. That's coming up in about a half hour, maybe 40 minutes time here on the show. But we lead off today with a story out of Alberta. Great reporting by Elise Von Scheel, uh, uh out of the uh, Edmonton Bureau, the Legislative Bureau for the CBC, Alberta's Justice Minister Casey Madu. Fined for distracted driving last March. Uh, he called the chief of police in Edmonton about the ticket. That's Chief Dale McPhee. And just yesterday, Alberta's premier says he just found out about it, which I, I'm sure must be the truth. If the premier said he just found out about it, uh, why would he lie about that, right? He just found out about it, even though sources are telling reporters and columnists like Don Braid that virtually everybody in cabinet knew about this, but probably not Jason Kenney. Uh, he's asked Casey Madu to resign. This what Alberta's premier tweeted uh, just yesterday said he was profoundly disappointed uh, to hear that alberta's justice minister had called the police said i spoke with minister madu about the march 10th incident this was almost a year ago uh, reported in the media today premier says i conveyed to him my profound disappointment in his decision to contact edmonton's police chief after receiving a ticket for a traffic violation uh, the premier says Minister Madu told me he did not ask to have the ticket rescinded. No, of course not. No, of course. No, no, no. He wouldn't be calling to get the ticket rescinded. No, no, no. He didn't ask to get the ticket. That's not why he called. Uh, premier went on to essentially say, uh, nor was it his intention to interfere in the case. No, of course not. Obviously. No, 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 no. Minister of Justice, why would you call the police chief to interfere? I wasn't looking to interfere fear with it no don't misunderstand me please premier went on to say that he is relieving minister madu of his duties as a minister of the crown and uh alberta's energy minister sonia savage will be stepping in as the minister of justice uh and uh essentially the minister that'll oversee alberta's police Right. She's going to step in as Minister of Justice and Solicitor General General during Minister Madu's leave of absence. There will be an independent review and the premier promises that Albertans will be brought up to speed on the findings of that independent review. So what could Minister Madu have been hoping to accomplish by calling Edmonton's police chief? I mean, obviously, he wouldn't have been calling to get off a ticket on you know distracted driving, uh, being on his phone through a school zone. He says that wasn't the case. He says I was innocent. 
He says, uh, no, I wouldn't call to interfere. I wouldn't call to try to get the ticket taken away. Of course not. I mean, if you're if you're the if you're the minister of justice who oversees police departments and you call the chief of police, of course, you would not be calling to have your ticket wiped out. Of course not. Minister Madhu says in, in, instead, and I'll be somewhat careful with how I tread through this next patch of ground. Because there is a legitimate issue, a very legitimate issue that the minister brings up. Is he using it as a bulletproof cover right now? Is, is he hoping that this shield will help him out? Most likely. But he insists that as a black man, he's concerned that he was targeted by police because of the color of his skin. And that was his concern. He wanted to address the, the potential that perhaps he was pulled over and cited because of his ethnicity, because he's a black man. Now, I'm not going to sit here and take pot shots at the reality that people are carded, that people do experience discriminatory practices when it comes to policing. As a matter of fact, Minister Madhu himself in past has addressed carding, has said that it's no longer going to be tolerated in the province of Alberta, and he's taken steps to make that a reality now whether or not he's done it in fulsome fashion or to a point where you would describe it as effective remains debatable and we see a lot of conversation about that but this is a real issue that minister madu brings up in his own defense is it really the reason why he called edmonton's police chief dale mcphee well only casey madu and dale mcphee know that But the common sense that burns in my belly and yours, I'm sure, suggests to me that that may be a questionable assertion. You've also got to keep in mind that this is the justice minister that's making it more difficult, if not impossible, for Albertans themselves to fight their own traffic tickets. Check this out from Stephen Smith on Twitter yesterday. Said, you know what's extra outrageous about this Casey Madu thing? He wants to make it so that Albertans can't fight the tickets they receive. Uh, that's right. It's it, Believe it or not, you as an average citizen cannot, I'm not sure if you knew this or not, but you cannot speed dial the chief of police when you get a ticket. I'm not sure if some of you have tried that before. Typically, it doesn't work out. It's a tough phone number to find. And when you do finally track down the number, the chief's not always happy to get your call. Of course, the Minister of Justice has the number in his Rolodex, and so he has that quick access, but it's hard to ignore the irony here. So where does Casey Madu go from here? Political columnist Don Braid uh, taking this on in a piece this morning says that's a firing offense. Uh, There's no blurring of this red line when the politician who's effectively in charge of the police calls the police with any discussion of a personal case He's done himself out of the job. So what does this mean for Casey Madu? My guess is he probably won't be back as justice minister, but he's an important representative of the United Conservative Party. Uh, Number one, as a visible minority, uh, he's an important part of the front line when it comes to that party's optics. It may feel like a crass or a crude way to put it, but it's a fact. Second of all, he is literally the only United Conservative MLA in the entire city of Edmonton. He's the representative in South Edmonton for, for Edmonton White Mud, I believe, off the top of my head, isn't it? Or he's a, It's a South Edmonton riding. I know I should know that. He's a South Edmonton MLA. He's the only United Conservative representative in the entire city. And so people calling for Casey Madu's resignation, not as a minister of justice, but as an MLA period, are likely to be disappointed because I don't believe there's any way that the premier wants to see that riding go to a by-election right now. As a matter of fact, I think that right now, based on the temperature and based on former Minister Madu's popularity or lack thereof, he's had a rough and bumpy ride carrying water for the premier for the past year or so. I'm not sure that the UCP would win that by-election. That was a tight race out of the gates as is in an election back in 2019 that saw the conservatives sweep to victory. I mean, they had more than a million votes for the first time in Alberta's history. Madu barely won the riding. 
So you're not going to, I think, win that riding back in a by-election when the MLA has resigned in disgrace after misusing the power of his office. This is an interesting story to keep an eye on. I suspect that this independent investigation uh, likely will not satisfy the people that want to see Madhu absolutely crucified for this. I think it'll probably fall somewhere in the middle. If you're skeptical about the independent nature of the investigation, well, we'll be keeping an eye on it. And of course, we'll focus on this story. We'll take another little portion of our focus and allocate it here because there's a lot going on. You remember, this has been a tough stretch for Jason Kenney's cabinet, right? You had a a cabinet minister, uh, Tracy Allard, resign as part of the Aloha Gate scandal, right? Do not travel, except for we're all going to travel. You remember that? That was about a year ago. That was over the Christmas and New Year break of 2020 into 2021. So Minister Allard gone. You remember just a short time ago, what was it, a couple of months ago now, I think, the the Minister of Forestry, Agriculture, Devin Dreeshen, resigned after the Premier's office was sued by a former staffer alleging that there had been misuse of alcohol and other problems out of that ministry behind the closed doors, shields up, so to speak. So you have Minister Dreeshen, former Minister Dreeshen, sitting in the penalty box right now. And now you've got this with Minister Madhu. So these are tough optics for this premier, the tough optics for this party. Of course, the political opportunism abounds and the opposition has lots to say about this. I'm more interested to know how you feel about it. You can hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag RealTalkRJ, or of course, you can send us an email anytime to talk at RyanJesperson.com. And we're going to be getting to some of your emails a little bit later on in the show today. If there's one that arrives in time about Madhu, maybe we'll get to it. But I have a great email from Ali who wrote in about our conversation yesterday. Toxic positivity. Won't want to miss that. And Jesse wrote in. Jesse is a grade six teacher in southern Alberta. Took the time to write in about masks and the whole back to school plan. And those are those are two emails that I'm going to make sure that we get to today before we say goodbye, before we sign off. Uh, Listen, if you're heading out of town yourself and you're interested in keeping a little money in your jeans, as opposed to just giving it away, you know that that parking, when you're away for a week or two at a time, can, can the price can really rack up. Well, that's not the case if you're parking at Jet Set Parking. If you're flying out of Edmonton's International Airport, we want to encourage you to save money by booking online. So you go to jetsetparking.com. You select EIA, and then you use the promo code REALTALK. If you use the promo code REALTALK to book your parking between now and the end of the year, you can book it now for travel in November. No problem. The promo code REALTALK gets you parking for $7 a day. That's an unbelievable value. $7 a day using the promo code REALTALK at jetsetparking.com. Our friends at Park Power want to remind you that this is the time of year where it makes sense to evaluate how you have your utilities structured. In other words, are you going with the fixed or variable rate? You know, you take a look at what power is costing right now. You take a look at the cost of natural gas. You can make the decision that fits your family best by visiting parkpower.ca. And it's never been easier to switch over. They do all the work for you. You want to bring your business to the company that gives 10% of its electricity profits back to charities where they live and work? Then you want to go with Park Power. You can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website. And a big shout out to our friends at Friesen Brothers. They wanted me to remind you that right now, I mean, they've always got these deals going on and they're really proud of some of the fan favorites, the Mike's Meals that they present every single month. Well, this month's Mike's Meals is the Alberta Pierogi Pizza. And it is as good as it sounds. I can tell you based on firsthand experience, This pierogi pizza is topped with thinly sliced Alberta potatoes, cheddar cheese, bacon bits, and and just a a perfect kick of cayenne pepper. It's perfect for busy family weeknights as well as weekends, and you can find out more on their website at Friesen.com. Sam, can you call me up Aaron Hoyland's tweet from yesterday? I thought this was great about where people get their information. This is pretty funny. If you don't follow Aaron on Twitter, I'm going to get this guy on the show. He's become one of my favorite follows. He's bang on 
And this leads in nicely to our leadoff conversation today. Aaron yesterday says, hey, you know what? Uh, this is a couple of days ago. A shout out to everybody who gets their medical information from doctors and not a podcaster who used to host Fear Factor. That from Aaron Hoyland. And it leads nicely to a conversation with health law and policy expert, Professor Timothy Caulfield. You know him, the author of Relax, a guide to everyday health decisions with more facts and less worry. Alongside the president of the Canadian Society for Molecular Biosciences, Dr. Imogen Co. Both of them signatories to a letter, an open letter to the podcast platform Spotify, asking them to implement policy to rein in shows like Joe Rogan's, the Joe Rogan experience, the home, you might suggest, for misinformation. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Professor Caulfield and making her debut, Dr. Co. Thanks for thanks for making time for us. Dr. Co, why don't we start with you? Why did you sign on to this letter? What prompted you to actually put your name on it? Well, I'm delighted to be here. So thanks very much for having me. And it's always great to uh, see Tim. We uh, we chat regularly behind the scenes on the on the interwebs. Um, so I signed the letter because um, it's really important for scientists and science communicators and clinicians and health professionals and everybody who's working so hard during this pandemic to take care of people and to provide the best information and to, to do the science, to do the research, um, that all of, all of these people in Canada, that we stand up and we say enough, enough with the misinformation, enough with the monetization of fear mongering and enough with um, uh, giving platforms to people whose, uh, whose business model is really sort of outrage and misinformation and undermining um, all of the people who are working really hard to take care and make people better. So I, I just felt it was time for, to sort of stand up and be counted. And I've been talking and speaking and working in this area for a long time. Um, and when this letter came along, it was like, yes, of course, mm. I'm going to sign it. It's the right thing to do. Tim, this was, as far as I can tell, the letter was prompted officially by a uh, a New Year's Eve episode, a December 31st episode on the Joe Rogan Experience featuring Robert Malone, um, a physician that's been identified in recent months as a potent spreader of vaccine misinformation. He, he described the trust that most Americans show in the vaccine effort as mass formation psychosis. And Rogan had him on. Uh, was that the interview that, that kind of put the burr under your saddle, as they say? Uh, that one and the one that was just, I think, a few weeks earlier with Peter McCullough, um, oh, yeah. another uh, physician that pushes misinformation. And, and I think it's really important to emphasize this isn't marginal stuff they're pushing. This is stuff that is clearly wrong, as my friend Imogen can highlight. It's clearly wrong. They're wrong about ivermectin. They're wrong about hydroxychloroquine. They're wrong about, about how they portray the risks associated with, with vaccines on and on and on they're just demonstrably incorrect and so i think it's really important to highlight that and the other thing ryan that i i think is essential is we're not we're not pushing the idea of censorship or cancel culture or silencing we're asking spotify and people that have podcasts <laughs> to make reasonable programming decisions. You know, uh, we're asking editors to make reasonable editorial decisions. We are asking them not to promote something that's called false balance. You know, deciding not to have someone on that spreads lies isn't censorship. You know, I, actually, I feel like I'm silenced. Tucker Carlson hasn't had me on Fox yet to talk about how he spreads misinformation. He's censoring me, Ryan. He's censoring me. It's silencing. <laughs> it's silencing. It's cancel culture via Tucker Carlson. These are we're asking for sensible science informed programming decisions uh, so that we don't spread misinformation. But, you know, I mean, Imogen, you know, as well as I do, you know, as well as Tim does, that uh, Rogan and his millions and millions of followers will push back on this and say you're simply trying to silence people that are as as you introduced us to the phrase. I'd never heard it before. Professor Caulfield, last time you were on the show, jacking off like J. I kind of did a bit of a double take when you said it. But J.A.Q., I am just asking questions. I am jacking. I'm just asking questions. Imogen, people will ask, Rogan's fans will ask, what are you so afraid of? Well, I, I think, 
think as Tim has said, you know, science is a process and we're not afraid of asking questions and we have a process um, to ask questions. That's what we do. We're always asking questions and we're building uh, a body of evidence, a body of data. Uh, we're building a weight of consensus that leads us towards explanations for the observations around us and gives us the best evidence available at that point in time to make recommendations. They're going to help take care of people and, and give people accurate, reliable information on the weight of a whole body of work and research, all based on asking questions. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And that's what people are entitled to. People are entitled to have access, free access, free and open access to that, uh, that reliable information, that weight of evidence, that consensus. Um, and uh, we're not afraid of people asking questions, but we will hold people accountable for falsehoods and for misinformation. And I mean, I, I, I think I might flip that question. Like, why are they... Um, afraid of uh, being challenged or being held accountable for what is egregious, outrageous lies, falsehoods, um, conspiracy theories that are actually really very harmful. I mean, they damage people. So the question should be why, you know, and what, and the why is very much, it's a great business model. So taking advantage of people, uh, taking advantage of vulnerable people, I think we should be questioning you know, what are the motivations there? It's, it's not appropriate to be treating people this way. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tim, you mentioned Fox hosts and we've seen other podcasters. And I mean, the, the truth comes out a lot of the time where a lot of these uh, individuals with big, significant public platforms uh, questioning you know, the validity of vaccination science or questioning the wisdom of getting vaccinated have also uh, come clean and divulged that they all have been vaccinated uh, while at the same time pushing the theories that you shouldn't be. I think that that certainly says a lot. Uh, let's be honest. Spotify gave Joe Rogan $100 million a short while ago. Uh, I mean, what's your hope that this podcast platform in particular will do anything to stop the success of their prized pony of the Joe Rogan experience? I don't think it, it it's going to change anything. <laughs> you know, it, there's been silence right from Spotify uh, since the letter the letter went out. Uh, um, but uh, you know, I, I think this conversation is still incredibly important. You know, it maybe maybe it's not going to be this time, but maybe they'll hesitate the next time, right? And and maybe we will see an evolution in in their policies around around misinformation. Maybe they're going to have behind the scenes conversations with with Joe Rogan. You know, we've seen that slight evolution with some some people, even my friend Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, she's been uh, criticized constantly. And, and we have seen it. It's still uh, not great, by the way, but we have seen a slight evolution and any evolution in the direction towards science is good. And, and I think it's really important to highlight that there is evidence that what he does, you know, that the, the platforming these individuals, giving them, uh, you know, sort of enabling the misinformation there is evidence this does harm, right? You know, Imogen and I are just speculating. We we know that this does harm. Uh, there's been a really interesting studies around the concept of false balance, right? When you do this false balance, and by that, I mean, you portray a fringe idea as if it has credibility and, and it's sort of balanced with what the weight of evidence actually says on a topic. Uh, we know that false balancing an issue can change people's perspectives. And, and that's exactly what shows like Joe Rogan has done. And by the way, I, I did put out a tweet right before our show today and I hashtagged um, Robert Malone and Joe Rogan and the hate just piles on. He has followers that hang on his every word, including including Aaron Rodgers. Right? So, uh, uh, yeah, this does real damage and and pushing back like we're trying to do. It can help if only uh in an incremental manner, which is still valuable. Yeah, and if you'd like, by the way, if you're, if you're just listening to this or, or watching this and you'd like Professor Caulfield's take on the Green Bay Packers quarterback, you can check out his last appearance on the show. Um, Imogen, I, I want to pick up on, on what Tim just said. I mean, this, this legion of followers and uh you know we're, we're not going to name any names but i'll let you know we had endeavored to have a third voice a third signatory of this open letter joining the two of you this morning and multiple people told us that the blowback and the harassment that they're experiencing after signing this letter has been significant have you experienced that in the past couple of days um me but no maybe after this podcast i will i don't know um, yeah, I'm very aware of that. I'm very aware of that as a woman. 
um, having an opinion on social media. Absolutely. Um, the, you know, the misogyny, the hate, the, the racism, the homophobia um, are extreme and um, it can be extremely wearing and, and exhausting, particularly for some of my uh, younger colleagues. Um, so I think there is a, um, a, a sort of, uh, there's a sort of a caution about getting involved or speaking up because we know that some of that um, is very likely to come our way. I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm far enough along my career that I, you know, I have a very, I have a lot of privilege. I'm very secure in, in many ways. And so I can sort of weather that, but yes, I, I am thoughtful. I don't immediately jump on every opportunity to speak up. And I think it's really important that we also be having that conversation about, um, you know, the, the safety of scientists, of clinicians, of, of experts to speak to some of these issues where they've become so polarized and so, um, so hostile and so nasty that we almost can't have civil dialogue. And that's a very dangerous sort of slippery slope to be heading down. So um, I'm conscious of it. I'm aware of it. Um, I have, you know, I have sort of strategies to deal with it. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate in many ways, I'm much better off than other people, but I do worry about that a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is the type of thing where we see that happen, where I think people in good faith are, are trying to impact positive change, and then they're absolutely piled on. Yeah. And you can never blame someone for saying, that's the last time I'm sticking my neck out there. But then also, I mean, to state the obvious, the mob wins, right? And it's mm -hmm. it's very easy to sit from a position of comfort, or like you've said, Dr. Ko, a position of privilege, and to simply say, but it's important we do this, but it is. You know, I mean, this, you know, this list of almost 300 names, 270 signatories on this letter uh, sends a very clear message. There's nobody, by the way, that just waltzed onto that letter. I mean, the list of names yeah. is, is pretty impressive. How does something like this happen? Like, Tim, how did, how did this wind up in front of you or, or, or how do you decide what you will sign or, or what you won't? How does something like this come together? Um, this was organized funny because Imogen and, and several of us uh, actually as part of the Science Up First team, you know, I refer to our our social media initiative called Science Up First, which is an effort to spread misinformation. We were talking about sending a letter to Spotify kind of, you know, behind the scenes and trying to organize it. And then a group, I think, led from Stanford and a Ben, um, Ben, I don't want to guess, Reen, I think is how you pronounce his name. Yeah, I think he was he was. Uh, the one uh, who started and we had an email conversation about it. Uh, and so, you know, props to him and he got it rolling and uh, tried to get what, you know, individuals that he thought, you know, have done a lot of work in the area of misinformation to, to speak up. So it, it, fantastic that he did that. And everyone, uh, you know, jumped on, on the letter immediately because it was, everyone viewed this as, as clearly being needed. And the other interesting thing about the the people that signed this, it's a very interdisciplinary group, which I think is fantastic. And what's, of course, the haters have tried to highlight that it's not 270 MDs. Uh, uh, that was one of the very first things that, you know, the haters tried to do to delegitimize de it. But what you have in that list is a very interdisciplinary group of, of communicators. So you have people who are science communication experts, you have people that are many MDs, you have people that are bench scientists, you have a, a wonderful collection of science, scientists that are looking at this issue from, from different angles, and they all agree, this is a real problem that needs to be dealt with. So the haters are cool with Joe Rogan's expertise, but they're not cool yeah. that not all 270 are MDs. <laughs> OK, just just yeah, so that's exactly right. I always think that's that's ironic. And, and apparently we're all snowflakes for uh -huh. complaining about Joe Rogan, but they're not snowflakes for complaining about us. I I can't follow it. Yeah. I heard somebody suggest once that when you get enough snowflakes together, they call it an avalanche. So you better watch your ass, which I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Dr. Imogen Co. Professor Timothy Caulfield, our guests on this edition of Real Talk. Thanks for making time for us. And thank you for your advocacy. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us on. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. You, you can find those two uh, on Twitter. Of course, we tag uh, Sarah Hoyles does all of our guests from our tweet from our official account. You can give us a follow at Real Talk RJ. Uh, every morning we send that tweet out to let you know who's coming up on the show. Um, you can chime in, of course, on our on our live chat right now. Uh, you know, Arnold says, I mean, they're trying to get the most popular podcast in existence canceled. Uh, not trying to get it to do better editorializing, just straight gone. I'm not taking a side, but what do they expect? I don't think they're trying to get the podcast canceled. Um, they write in the closing paragraph of the letter. You can find the, the letter in its entirety online. 
Um, you know, this is not only a scientific or medical concern. It's a sociological issue of devastating proportions. And Spotify is responsible for allowing this activity to thrive on its platform. We, the undersigned doctors, nurses, scientists, and educators, thus call on Spotify to immediately establish a clear and public policy to moderate misinformation on its platform. So that's what they're asking for. Whether or not that's going to happen remains to be seen. I think an effort like this is important, at least because it gets people thinking and it gets people talking. Uh, I know, you know, I have personal friends of mine that absolutely adore the Joe Rogan podcast. You know, they listen to Real Talk after they listen to the Joe Rogan experience. I mean, I put sugar in their gas tanks and slash their tires. Don't worry. But, you know, they'll learn eventually. But they love this guy. And they'll get in touch with me and say, hey, did you hear who Rogan just had on? A guy that's like blowing the doors off everything that people think they know about vaccines. And I just go, oi, vey. And you just sort of hope that the more that we have these conversations, the more that people will learn to recognize or how to recognize valid, credible information and how to recognize red flags at the same time. Talk at RyanJespin.com is where you can send us your emails. I want to remind you that uh, we're really proud to partner with the team at Kubi Energy. And right now, if you're looking for a new gig, you're a skilled worker, perhaps you're a journeyman electrician or somebody that's been interested in getting into the trades, but you've been waiting for the right opportunity, kubienergy.ca is where you can go right now to get in touch with the team at Kubi because they're hiring. That's right. It's an exciting time. They're starting to hire for the 2022 season, and so they're looking for salespeople, inside sales, outside sales. They're going to be hiring up to 10 apprentices and four journeyman electricians. What an opportunity. So you're not an electrician yet, but you want to be? They'll make that happen for successful candidates with these open gigs. We're happy to proudly partner with Kubi Energy, and I know that they'd be a great employer. If you're looking for work, this could be the opportunity you've been waiting for. You can contact them online right now at kubienergy.ca. We're also, of course, very proud to be partnering with the family-owned Kendall Jackson Vineyard. They take big steps to leave small footprints. You can learn more about their sustainability practices on their website, kj.com it's also where you can learn more about their wine club and if you scroll down on their homepage, you'll even find amazing recipes from the kendall jackson blog that's right duck breast with charred eggplant or what about mushrooms three ways how to cook crab all of it paired with wonderful kendall jackson wines you can find kendall jackson one of america's most popular brands anywhere you buy fine wines and if you don't see it there make sure you ask for kendall jackson coming up in about 10 minutes i mean speaking of crab and mushrooms and duck breast we're going to be talking about food prices and what inflation is going to look like in that arena with dr sylvain charlebois that's coming up but i wanted to read a couple of emails that we've received uh, over the past couple of days uh, we're so appreciative when you take the time to let us know what you think about what you've heard on the show if you're tuned in yesterday you may have heard my conversation on toxic positivity this was a great conversation and it, it got us thinking about the pressure that people may feel when it comes to looking positive or presenting yourself as positive all the time it's pressure that people feel to portray themselves as as maybe always having good days right uh, to portray themselves as as never really struggling to portray yourselves as strong no matter what you can check out yesterday's episode for more on toxic positivity it got ali thinking ali said good morning i'm writing to add to the show's conversation about toxic positivity my experience with this concept existed before I knew what to call it. I lost a parent to mental illness when I was 14, and I lost my other parent uh, for a number of years to the subsequent heartbreak, grief, and mental illness that they faced as a result. The way that communities endure and support those that are grieving makes a marked impact on how functional people who have experienced loss can be. I'm 35 years old now, and it took me 20 years to grieve, to properly grieve the loss of my dad when I was 14. And the only reason that I felt I was allowed the time or space to do so is because I also recently experienced the loss of a failed marriage. 
It saddens me that people are expected to have a timeline for their pain or for their stressors or to feel the need to present it in a consumable format for support to be given. You know, it, 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 it's, it gets to the point where I feel like most people who are guilty of practicing toxic positivity are so afraid of losses themselves that they force the fallacy of wellness to the detriment of themselves and those around them. No one is perfect. The message that you need to think positively or react to a loss in a positive way or to limit how or for how long or when you're allowed to grieve is malignant. Some of the most beautiful and supportive exchanges and friendships I have with people are born out of pain. And to deny ourselves and others the ability to collectively grieve or heal is counterintuitive to the grief process and the human experience. Isn't Ali bang on with this? Ali says, I'm only speaking of my experience with bereavement or divorce, but the concept applies across so many struggles that people face. In my limited experience with bereavement or divorce, you know, it it showed up in how others reacted to these things and also mental or physical illness. I've seen that mindset harm folks who experience marginalization and pain due to the loss of their culture, their gender identity, their sexuality, even their spiritual practices. Humans are afraid of pain and illness and death and discomfort. They are subsequently disengaged from conversations that make them humbled and experience fear around the realities that accompany these losses and the strife of the human condition. The single worst practice that anyone can engage in is policing the pain of others in order to avoid their own. Toxic positivity is maladaptive to a community, and it's a cowardly act used by some intentionally to avoid the discomfort that accompanies empathy. Having experienced it, I do my best to hold space for the struggle and pain of my community because it's the most honest and healthy way to support people who are struggling. I hope that your discussion ultimately encourages people to sit with their reactions that are unhelpful and to arise from their personal desire, whether it's subconscious or not, to avoid fear and grief because the rest of us need community to validate our experiences. What we don't need are platitudes like live, laugh, love, or hashtag blessed. Be human. Be messy. Be honest about your struggles with those around you and practice empathy as often as you can. That from Allie. What an email. So that automatically is going to go into the hopper for consideration of January's eel email of the month. Of course, uh, at the beginning of every month, we award uh, a, an official Real Talk Studio mug to the author of what we have deemed to be the email of the month for the month prior. It was Curtis that took honors last month for his email on Photo Radar and white privilege. Boy, did that ever get me thinking. And I'm grateful for real talkers like Allie who just put it all out there. Sarah Hoyles works very hard behind the scenes to produce this show. And I would imagine, and I know that when people send us emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com, it goes to me, it goes to you. An email like that has to validate the work that you put in behind the scenes. When somebody takes the time to put something like that in front of us, uh, really remarkable stuff that I know that as a team, we sure don't take for granted. Yeah, as soon as I saw it come into the the inbox with the title, I was just like, "Oh boy, oh boy, okay, someone someone enjoyed the 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 guest and the content." So, check mark. Yay. There Got you go. Done. There you go. Good stuff. How are you wrapping your mind around the Casey Madu story? I know that's what a lot of people in our neck of the woods in the province of Alberta are going to be talking about if you're just joining us, if you're just streaming our audio live on the Mixler audio app and you're just tuning in, Alberta is now former justice minister on leave from the ministry as uh, premier promises an independent investigation after Casey Madu called Edmonton's police chief after he got a ticket for distracted driving in a school zone. What do you make of it Hoyles? Uh, well, the, the whole thing that Kenny actually said, stepping back, he didn't even say a resign. Yeah. So to me, I almost even wonder, will he, will he resign? Will he be asked to resign? just seeing, you know, the track record of this government and what Kenny 
the low bar that Kenny demands from his MLAs. Uh, I I don't know. I don't even think that he will. This is well, like, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, just basically that he doesn't demand very much from his MLAs. Yeah, it, like I was saying earlier too, what makes it really interesting is the fact that that uh, Casey Madu is is the lone conservative. He's on an island in Edmonton, right in that that South Edmonton riding. Um, he's the only UCP MLA in the city, and so people that are calling for Casey Madu's resignation, I, I mean, I I would almost go so far as to you know, I I, I put money on it. I don't think there's a chance that happens. Um, Not you know, gonna happen. No. It, 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 he, he's he's chummy, as a matter of fact. I'm not going to try to draw direct lines here, but I will say he's quite chummy, and there's photographic evidence of it all over the place uh, with Calgary City Councilor Sean Chu. Uh, the two of them seem to, to gravitate toward each other. They seem to find each other at parties and fundraisers and gatherings. And so if, if they are, if they do happen to be cut from the same cloth with regards to their persuasion of accountability or to whom they answer or to what is an appropriate answer or response to scandal, obviously, Obviously, both of them facing very different criticisms. Um, I would suspect that Casey Madu uh, will defiantly remain in the position as an MLA. Now, whether or not he's returned uh, to, to a cabinet minister position, um, obviously, it was important for the premier to have a cabinet minister in Edmonton. Right. In so many ways, you look at this and you say that if you, if you get a liberal uh, elected federally in the province of Alberta, like like George Chahal or Randy Boissonneau, uh, it, you know, you know that at least one of them is going to be getting a cabinet post in a, in a Trudeau government because they're an Alberta MP. And of course, Randy Boissonneau named the minister of tourism. George Chahal has faced just a, a, a myriad of problems uh, since he was elected. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in Calgary. It's the same for a conservative MLA in Edmonton. You've got a pretty good chance of being named to cabinet. If you're a conservative MLA in Edmonton, um, most especially one, I, I think, like Casey Madu, who has shown a great allegiance to Premier Jason Kenney. Like I said earlier, he's carried a lot of water for Jason Kenney, and he's shown a lot of praise and a lot of support for the Premier, even at his lowest polling moments. And so that's something I think that's relevant to this discussion. You can let us know what you think about it. Uh, we'll be getting to more of your comments. Plus, I got another email coming up about masks and the whole back-to-school plan from a teacher, a grade 6 teacher that's in the classroom. This is a so-called frontline report, and we'll be getting to that. But we want to turn our attention to food prices right now. Uh, Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, I've had an opportunity to speak with him several times including on this show. He's the director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab out of Dalhousie University in Halifax, and he's the lead on the new Canada's Food Price Report for 2022. You've likely heard him on the Food Professor podcast, and it's a pleasure to welcome him back to the show. Dr. Charlebois, I don't think it's I don't think it's too late into January to wish you a happy new year on the 18th. I think we can get away with it. Nice to see you again. It's, it seems like a long year already. <laughs> know, doesn't it? I was thinking that. It's like January My feels goodness. like it's been three months already. Uh, this is an annual effort for you and your team, the Canada's Food Price Report. We'll get into some of the specifics and, and some of the reasons or the drivers here with regards to the trends. But but how do you approach this every year and, and how is this year's edition maybe a little bit different? So we have uh, four partnering institutions uh, involved with the report, uh, Dalhousie, obviously, the University of Guelph in Ontario, the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatchewan, and uh, the University of British Columbia. So all four of us, we come to the same table and, and share our forecasts, and we use different technologies like econometrics, machine learning, and we provide a report. And, uh, and of course, all four reports are different. And so the key, of course, with the 28 of us around the table is to agree, is, is to come to some sort of consensus. And, and that's how, that's what drives the report in the end. So the forecast is really a, a combination of several discussions we have about food prices, what we think is going to impact food prices over the next 12 months. Okay, so let's get into this. Uh, your report shows uh, forecasted annual food expenditures of, of just under fifteen thousand dollars, fourteen thousand seven hundred sixty-seven. That's up almost a thousand dollars, up nine hundred sixty-six dollars from what was observed as the total annual cost in twenty twenty-one. Are we talking about households? Who are we talking about? Who can expect to spend about fourteen thousand and change on food? An average family of four, essentially. So two adults, uh, man and woman, and two kids. Uh, boy and girl between the age of 11 and 15, essentially. So in the report, you can basically 
uh, create your own family, your own household. Uh, it, it, it's divided up in, into uh, for, for an individual. So if you're, say, a woman, uh, even for pregnant women, they are, there's actually costing, exact costing. And so it's very, our approach is very granular. So you'll actually, you'll be able to budget exactly or at least know exactly how much you should be paying for food over the next 12 months based on numbers we provide at the end of the report. Okay, so uh, I'm just doing the math off the top of my head. Don't hold me to account here, but 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 roughly that's about a six to seven percent increase in food cost uh, year over year. And I know that inflation typically people will say inflation can be between one and three percent. Economists may cringe at that number, but around two percent ish. So this is obviously pretty dramatic. Uh, why is it happening? What's driving this increase? Yeah, so we're expecting an increase of up to 7%, essentially, which is a lot. I mean, let's be honest, it's yeah. a lot compared to what we're seeing elsewhere in the economy. And and I would say there are three reasons why we're seeing higher food prices. One, uh, obviously, uh, we're seeing problems with labor. Uh, Omicron made things worse. Uh, we have fewer people to do the things we need to do in the food industry. And it's not just Canada. It's across the industrialized world. We're seeing the problem. Uh, supply chain woes, we're seeing it right now. In fact, it's really getting worse. Uh, I don't know about you guys in Alberta, but uh, in many parts of the country, we're seeing more empty shelves. Now, I don't want your listeners to panic. We're, we're still, you're still going to be able to buy what you need but you may not be able to find what you want uh, as 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 many times as you used to. That's a, that's the that's the one thing. And the other thing, of course, is is the weather. I mean, the the in the northern hemisphere, in particular, last year we had some issues uh, with droughts, uh, floodings in BC. Uh, we had the heat dome as well. So a lot of things have complicated things in Canada. We had droughts in Russia, floods in Europe, and of course droughts in the U.S. So Commodities are much more extensive. So if you're producing food, you're paying more for your inputs. So you've, yeah, I mean, you've been doing this for at least 12 years, right? This is the 12th edition of the Canada's yep. Food Price Report. Have you seen um, so-called natural disasters have as demonstrable of an impact in years past as you did this year? Uh, I don't remember. I don't think so. No, mm. uh, I mean, Typically, you would see the currency being an issue. If you remember the cauliflower crisis, that was due to currency just dropping uh, in one month. And so you can see some of these things happening. But the weather itself uh, has been a huge problem this year. I mean, some of the extremes that we've seen is uh, are, are precedent, really. Yeah, this from Kim, who's watching us live. She says, my teens are never moving out, are they? I mean, this is, you know, Kim. <laughs> Kim's joking around, but but at the same time, I mean, the, the no laughing matter for families uh, whose food budgets were probably already stretched. 7% is a big jump. Um, Sam, let's put that chart up again. This is an interesting one because it shows where these price increases are, are forecasted manifest themselves. And what we see there is that, you know, for example, baked goods, when it yep. comes to food price forecast, baked goods expected to rise five to seven percent. Dairy expected to rise six to eight percent. Same with restaurants costs going up yep. six to eight percent. But then you see some of them that are that are not expected to rise at all, as a matter of fact, or at least in line with inflation like meat and yep. seafood. What is it about proteins that's keeping the prices relatively low? It's very rare, no pun, to see meat prices uh, go up significantly two years in a row. Well, because all we're uh, hearing is that meat, meat prices are through the roof, and that's why people are eating less red meat. I, I hear that all the time. Uh, which is true, but I think 2022 will be a kinder year to meat lovers. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's good news for you, Ryan. Uh, and if you're into rice, by the way, rice is actually cheaper now than last year. So they are deals. I mean, basically, even though uh, food prices are going up, it doesn't mean that you have to spend more on food. If you have a strategy, if you look around, if you actually buy the right things, if you go and visit more than one stores, there's always ways to save uh, money. Uh, what we're trying to do with the report is to measure an indicator. So food prices are going up. It doesn't mean that you have to be a victim of that phenomena. Are, what are, are, can I, like, do we need to have separate conversations about all of the different 
uh, items that we've just discussed. For example, you know, if baked goods are expected to rise six to eight percent, if dairy is expected to rise by about the same, are there different contributing factors to each of these? I mean, I would imagine that, that restaurants I, restaurants will be an own separate discussion. But what about everything else? Yeah, I can walk you through all the categories yeah. very quickly. So, restaurants, obviously, if you've been out <laughs> at all, many prices have been adjusted because, well. Input costs are much more expensive to, f- to feed customers. It's getting more expensive. Wages are more are higher now in the industry. So that's why we're expecting increases there. Dairy is the big story of the year. We just saw the Canadian Dairy Commission uh, basically grant an increase of 8.4% for milk to milk producers. That's obviously going to have an impact on, on dairy processors uh, over time. Lactalis, just before the holidays, was announcing an increase of 15% for, uh, for dairy products like cheese, yogurt, things like that. So that's really the main driver there for dairy. Uh, for bakery, there's, there's, there was consolidation in the industry. So uh, Western Bakeries was sold uh, in 2021. So there are fewer players. When you have fewer players in the industry, you tend to see prices go up. And we're expecting bakery to be a bit of an issue in 22 as a result of that. Before the, the bread price fixing scandal, uh, bread really was very expensive and things ca- has calmed down the last four or five years, but we're expecting 2022 to be a, a different year. Pr- produce, uh, right now <laughs> with supply chain woes, we're seeing it with the vaccine mandate, access to food, access to produce, especially in the winter, is a problem. And so we're expecting prices to be much higher. Hang on, hang on. Spell, spell it out for me, Doc. What does what the vaccine mandate have to do with access to produce? What am I missing? So as of last Saturday, uh, truckers coming into Canada have to be fully vaccinated or else they have to quarantine for 14 days, get tested. American drivers are turned, are turned away, essentially. And so uh, right now, we're pretty concerned about that because on the Canadian side, we're... we're we're looking at eight to 16,000 truck drivers being impacted by the mandate. On the American side, it's going to start next weekend on January 22nd. And that's 125,000 truckers being impacted by a vaccine mandate going into the U.S. So fewer truckers to move the same amount of food around. So obviously, at some point, you're going to, have, you're going to see fewer, less food being trucked around. That's $21 billion worth of food that goes through that border every single year. So obviously, we don't see how the vaccine mandate won't have an impact on access to different products like vegetables, fruits in the winter. People can uh, check out your piece, as a matter of fact, a column that ran in the Toronto Sun just a few days ago. Uh, the headline, Trucker Vaccination Policy Will Harm Food Chain. Um, uh, Sylvain, I don't want to make any assumptions, but let me just, I want to get the lay of the land, understand the context of the question. Are you, your, and forgive it, don't roll your eyes at the question, but are, are you a supporter of vaccines? Are you yourself vaccinated? And, and, and based on that, do you believe that the government is making a misstep in requiring truckers crossing the border into Canada to be vaccinated? What's your official position on that? So, yeah, full disclosure, I'm vaccinated. My family's vaccinated. We actually got Omicron before the holidays oh, ourselves yeah. as an entire family. No symptoms. We're all fine. We're all good. I believe that vaccines did help, to be honest, because we just it was like the flu for us. So yeah. we were lucky. Uh, I can't, as a scientist, I can't really comment on vaccines specifically. What I can comment on is uh, is on how the vaccine mandate can impact our nation's food security. And I'm concerned about that for sure, because it's being implemented in the middle, middle of winter with Omicron. And Omicron has violently impacted the food industry. I mean, if you talk to anybody from farm to store, they will tell you that Omicron has absolutely devastated the, the food economy overall. Like and like so, dramatically more than Delta or than previous waves of COVID, Omicron in particular? Absolutely, because everyone's getting sick at the same time. Yeah, And uh, not violently sick, but they have to stay home. And if you've been in contact with someone who 
is sick, you have to stay home as well. So it's a lot of people who have to stay on the sidelines while you have to produce the same amount of food uh, over and over again. So the the power for the industry to execute and deliver and distribute food has been severely handicapped by Omicron. And, and when you add the vaccinated on top of that right now, it's just ill time. My suggestion to the to the government would, would have been to delay the vaccine mandate. If, if Ottawa believes that a vaccine mandate at a border is necessary, fine. However, it's not the right time. We've got some interesting uh, comments here. You know, Tracy, who's watching us live, wonders how come nurses and, you know, Canadian military, oil and gas workers who traveled to other countries before the pandemic had to be vaccinated. Uh, but truckers are, are having these stupid protests and blocking traffic. Uh, meantime, others, you know, Tracy says, I have to believe that many class one truckers are vaccinated. Uh, she says, but then again, you know, I was shocked to learn that my mom's cancer staff in her rural hospital were not uh, crazy fast. Eddie wonders, well, aren't truckers alone? On the highway, right? And Edmonton Chump says, I don't think that unvaccinated truckers are going to be causing the problems. Interesting. Um, we're talking to Dr. Sylvain Charlebois. You can find him on Twitter at Food Professor. Am I reading the numbers correctly? Am I understanding this correctly, that food prices are expected to rise in some provinces and not others? Can, can you explain that to us? Well, food prices are going to go up. Go up everywhere uh, but some provinces are likely more vulnerable than others uh, i actually think that out west uh, things are going to get uh, you're going to be close to that seven percent for 2022 because of some of the issues that we're seeing right now with supply chains but the one thing ryan i want to i want to emphasize on in, in terms of of how we you know implement these public health measures and and this vaccine mandate is particularly of great concern to me at least, because it's the first time we actually have seen a public health measure impacting our border. And that border is super critical for our food security uh, in Canada in particular. Uh, I, I would say this, I, I think it's time right now to strike a, a, a more functional balance between saving lives and, and, keep, and keeping Canadians fed. And I, I'm not sure we're there yet. And I, I think there's been a lot of some of the decisions that we've seen. And of course, the other thing that uh, we're not talking about are is this ban on on uh, on temporary foreign workers helping farmers, uh, especially in Ontario. A lot of farmers are actually looking for some help. They can't recruit right now because of this temporary ban imposed by by Ottawa. Again, another decision made that could actually impact our nation's food security. So. I know this virus is is impacting a lot of people, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we don't disrupt our capacity to feed people in this country. I, I'm not trying to weave stories together that have no business being woven together, but isn't it interesting uh, day over day on this show, we have different conversations right now. You're saying a lot of the policies that Canada has implemented are are hurting or threatening Canada's food security, whether it's temporary foreign workers and their access to jobs, uh, the access that Canadian ag producers will have to those uh, workers that year over year have been hugely important. Uh, we talk about the border policy for unvaccinated truckers. And then yesterday we're talking about Novak Djokovic, the the, uh, the uh, you know world's number one tennis player banned. Uh, from the Australian Open, which is currently underway, uh, because Australia unwaveringly says, here's our policy. And uh, quite frankly, you're not coming in. It doesn't matter if you're the world's number one ranked or maybe perhaps the greatest tennis player in history. It doesn't matter. You're not coming in. Uh, nation over nation, such different policies. It's not lost on me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And he was just banned from the, the French Open, which is actually in four months from now. Can you imagine? So there's lots of of course, this vaccine uh, discussion uh, is dividing a lot of people. And yeah. uh, But like I said, my area of expertise is food distribution, food security. And I, I'm greatly concerned uh, about this, uh, this infatuation we have uh, over, over fighting this virus when in the end, I, I think we need to start from a policy perspective, we need to start befriending this virus and start living with it. Hang on. What do you mean? What, what does that look like in the context of what we're talking about today? I, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, normalizing how we manage risks. Uh, I mean, at some point we have to really rationalize how uh, we impact our economy for one. And secondly, I mean, our security, our food security, we are 
uh, a a we have a northern climate. Our agriculture is at is on pause right now in the middle of winter. We have to be realistic. We have an open economy in Canada. We operate with other nations around the world. And COVID, what, what COVID has taught us is that COVID will impact different markets at different times in different ways. So we have to coexist with other economies around the world who may not be impacted as much by COVID or may be impacted more by COVID. But at the end of the day, you need access to these markets and, and these markets need access to us at the same time. So we can't, I don't think we can continue to manage this contagion in isolation and think that everything will be fine and dandy. I, I actually do think that at some point in time, we need to accept the fact that this virus will remain with us for a very, very long time. I've, I've been I've been trying to sort of find the words to to um, nail down what I'm experiencing and what I'm seeing around me. And that's it, it's sort of like a change in attitude. Uh, we had an interesting conversation on the show just a few days ago, at, you know, at begging the question, should we all just go get Omicron? Or should we all just go get COVID and get it over with? And we don't ask the question in glib fashion. Um, and, and, and a spoiler alert, the question, the answer to the question is no. Uh, but I am noticing more and more people having the conversation or at least teeing it up like you are as well. Um, Sylvain, when it comes to what consumers are looking for, what consumers are asking for, you know, we've touched on the idea that, you know, some people are eating less red meat, as an example. I'm seeing some people say that in the live chat. It's not an attack on Canadian beef. Some people are just making that decision. That's one example. Um, how do consumer choices or consumer expectations impact food prices? Yeah, so the red meat story is uh, is an interesting one. I actually don't think that Canadians are walking away from red meat altogether. 91% of Canadians actually eat red meat still, uh, but they're eating less uh, because of price. I mean, and, and we saw that in 2008, 2009, by the way, with the financial crisis, People did walk away from red meat for a while, and they came back to red meat eventually. But consumption per capita is dropping. That's the fa that's a fact. When when pork and chicken, uh, those two, the other two components of the meat trifecta, is uh, those two components are doing very well overall. So animal proteins are still important. Uh, they still have currency uh, in, in the Canadian marketplace. But of course, when things uh, shift economically, consumers will consider other options. And it's not just about the trifecta. It's also about plant-based uh, proteins or vegetable proteins. Even seafood, we're seeing some traction there. Uh, more and more Canadians are actually considering seafood. And so because when you see prices rise, all of a sudden, different options will look very differently financially. Yeah, The margins are getting smaller and smaller. So seafood has always seen been seen as expensive, not so much anymore. When prices go up, do they ever come down? You ever have you ever done these these food price reports where you've seen something drop by five percent? Uh, I mean, that, people didn't notice because we've been talking about higher food prices, but vegetables are cheaper now than twelve months ago hmm. in Canada. Oh yeah, and why but, is that? Because Oh, I, I think it's, it has to do with, with supplies. I yeah. mean, there was plenty of supplies and we were lucky. Uh, I know that in the prairies where you are, things weren't great uh, with moisture, but Ontario and Quebec and even in the Atlantic where we are, uh, we, had, we had a fabulous season. And so that benefited uh, everyone across the country uh, in that produce section. So, but we, we don't expect the same thing this year, but I mean, there are other products that are actually cheaper than, than say, 20 years ago. Did, did you know, Ryan, that peanut butter is priced the same as 20 years ago in Canada? What? Really? Peanut butter. Yes. Why Why, yeah. why has it not uh, benefited from inflation like everything else on the menu? <laughs> we love peanut butter in Canada. It's a very, very important staple. But, I mean, we, we, we rarely talk about things that are actually priced the same. Uh, tofu is priced the same. Bananas are priced the same as 20 years ago. Yeah. Is that just because they've hit sort of their threshold or they've, they've kind of hit that point where it just doesn't make sense or, or maybe retailers couldn't get more for it than they already are? 
it's it's how the it's how the the it's how the governance structure of the industry is is set up essentially. So with bananas, for example, you have these uh, you have these four major producers that are in, un, amazingly well organized, and they basically keep the entire supply chain in check. So the the supply chain is very stable, and so every year I get reporters calling me, "Oh my God, uh, there's a fungus hitting bananas. We're going to run out of bananas." No. We're not. Same for coffee. Same for cocoa and chocolate. We're okay. We'll be fine. And by the way, chocolate is likely to be cheaper this year as well. Chocolate's going to be cheaper. Chocolate is going to be cheaper. St. Valentine's is right around the corner, so take advantage of that. Yeah, right as I'm trying to get back in shape, chocolate goes on fire sale. Perfect. Uh, You can check out Sylvain's podcast, The Food Professor, anywhere you find and download excellent podcasts. Uh, We've been talking to Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, the director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab out of Halifax's Dalhousie University. It's always nice to connect. Thanks for doing this. Take care, Ryan. Yeah, you got it. Uh, On our live chat, I've been trying to keep an eye on what you're saying. I mean, Lala Zaz wonders, what's the percentage of truckers that aren't vaccinated? Uh, If it's that high, maybe we need a targeted information program. That's an interesting note. Um, Dwayne says, it's no surprise to see this. Alberta has had the highest rate of inflation in Canada for many, many years. Wally says, we just need to test truckers at the border. This This should be easy. Uh, Kim PG is forecasting that the next pandemic thriller will be based on an unvaccinated trucker. (laughs) Scott says maybe we should start paying truckers more money so we can move more goods. It sounds to me like the market isn't addressing the needs. Eddie says our vaccine mandates, our vaccine passports are not working if truckers pose such a huge problem by getting out of their cabs. Yeah, who would have thought that the 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 classic Sam, I, I make a lot of these now because I'm the father of a six-year-old, the classic peanut butter and banana sandwich would be the inflation-proof sandwich. I mean, as long as the bread price fixing is under control and as long as uh, we saw that baked goods might be going up six to eight percent. But other than that, inflation-proof, peanut butter and banana. Well, uh, like bananas, cocoa, coffee, chocolate, like these are all Im- <clears throat> imports from places much 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 warmer than we are so like that one blew my mind yeah fascinating stuff air i said Straya says i'm just not convinced that continuing to focus on keeping COVID out when COVID is clearly already here trisha mc meantime spitting truth says dark chocolate is practically a vitamin and it's true In proper doses, I am not a doctor, but in proper doses, dark chocolate and red wine can be very, very good for you, right? You know it's true. Speaking of chocolate, what kind of a fool wouldn't roll right into a mention? A big shout out to our good friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. They want you to know that the real talker deal... For the month of January is a buy one, get one free offer for the take-home treats, the world-famous Dairy Queen Dilly Bars and Ice Cream Sandwiches. That's right. You visit a Dairy Queen at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, or Baseline Road. You order a box of Dilly Bars or a box of DQ Ice Cream Sandwiches, and they're going to give you a second box absolutely free. Now, I don't recommend taking them all down in one sitting, but stocking your freezer with DQ treats is one of the smartest moves you could ever make at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. A big shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. They've been bringing outdoor spaces to life for more than 20 years, proudly family owned. And the work never stops for them just because it may be minus 20 degrees Celsius and there's freezing rain all over the place and ice on the highways. Well, Mike and his team are still hard at work. Uh, This time of year, they're going to be designing the projects that they'll be building out starting in the spring. Of course, that means they're also putting in their orders for the construction materials that could be tied up for a number of weeks or months. Now is the time to get in touch with Eden Landscaping. If you'd like to see your project completed in time to enjoy it this summer, you can find them online at landscapeedmonton.ca. Our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge want to remind you that the selection hasn't been as good as it is now for a couple of years their lots are starting to fill up again with the grand cherokees those jeep wagoneers and of course the wildly popular back to back to back motor trend truck of the year the dodge ram 
1500 They've got Ram 1500 Classics on right now with special deals. Uh, I was telling you I'm driving right now the 2022 Ram 1500 Longhorn Edition. This thing is unbelievable. I'm not giving it back to them ever. I recommend it at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. And our friends at Local Waste, Local Environmental Services is what they're going by now. want to remind you that you can connect with them today for a bin out of their Edmonton or Regina operations. They're operating across the prairies and have been for more than a quarter century. Keeping it local. Integrity is their core value. They actually have the word framed and hanging on the wall at Local Environmental HQ. Uh, You can contact them right now for a quote. They'd love to earn your business. And don't forget, Local Environmental presenting Trash Talk. Every Friday here on the show, you've got something you want to get off your mind. You can send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Keep it quick. Keep it punchy. Keep it focused. And you could hear your email read as we wrap up our broadcast week. Friday's Trash Talk is presented by Local Environmental. Speaking of our email address, uh, we received uh, several yesterday that really caught our attention. One of them was from Jess, who wrote in, said, uh, Ryan and team, I'm a longtime listener and a first-time writer. Well, Jess, welcome to the inbox, says, I'm a grade six teacher in Calgary, and today we received our student masks provided by the government. First, uh, there were no staff available to sort and distribute the masks because we were short uh, three subs today for absent COVID positive teachers. So it was all hands on deck. And when my class received our masks, uh, to my surprise, they were far from the, the 80 medical grade masks that had been promised by the education minister as part of their back to school safely plan. Uh, these masks, as you can see, and Jess passed along some photos, says these are regular disposable masks with you know patterns of flowers and robots with a clear warning on the side that they do not prevent the spread of viruses. Uh, my students only received 10 Ten of them of note. That's 70 short of the government's promise. Also, trying to distribute masks uh, with flowers and robots and monsters on them to a room full of kids. You can imagine there were fights over who got which design. She said, perfect. That's exactly what I needed today. Jess says teachers also received a handful of masks for ourselves. 20 non-medical masks. Uh, no different than what I buy for $9 for 100 of them at Costco. Um, she says, is this really good use of taxpayer dollars? She says, we've got no word on when these rapid tests, we're supposed to be getting 10 of them, 10 per student and staff member. When those are set to arrive, we don't have those yet. Just says parents of absent COVID positive kids are emailing me asking about picking up their government issued medical grade masks so their kids can wear the proper masks when they return to school. She says, of note, I have the most wonderful and supportive families in the world, and I want to say thank you to every single one of them. Uh, She says, but I'm being completely upfront with them that the 10 masks that they will be receiving are no better than what the kids have been receiving or using all year, so don't rush to pick them up. The regular masks they've been using will work just fine. Jess says, I'm so disappointed in this government's return to school plan. I feel completely abandoned in my classroom, and I'm doing my best to keep my spirits up with kids who so desperately want to stay in person they so desperately want to remain with their friends i've got by the numbers 35 percent of my class isolating at home with covid so a third of our students but there's no plan for us to go online because nobody knows what the rules are anymore just says now the reason i'm writing is i want the public to know that the masks that they're paying for are totally regular masks and our kids and teachers are not being set up for success this plan is optics only So this government can say they did everything they could to support safe schools. Yeah, right. Jess says, thank you to Real Talk for being an incredible venue to vent and rant and share with an open audience. Jess, thanks for that. Thanks for putting it into words. Thanks for giving us a peek into your grade six classroom in Calgary. And of course, thanks for the great work you do as an educator. You can continue to, to stay in touch with us uh, through the day. Of course, we're checking our emails 24 hours a day. Okay, well, maybe that's not entirely true, but the inbox is open 24 hours a day. Coming up on tomorrow, you're not going to want to miss our show. Why did Alicia Dubois resign after just 14 months on the job as CEO of the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation? She's going to tell us. Plus, how to elevate your personal brand. Your personal brand? Yeah, how to elevate it. Plus, we'll get into our question of the week, your forecast for 2022, and we'll take a trip to the mountains. My Jasper Memories. So